this computer. Okay, it's recording. So if I then make you the host. Okay, so you're the host now. So you can start. Okay, so today um, we're talking to Dr. Jessica Ranford. And Dr. Jessica is an occupational therapist who works at the Department of Neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Um, Jessica is talking to us today about sensory processing difficulties in FND. Um, this is an area that's of interest to us. A number of people with FND have sensory issues. A number of people report sensory processing challenges. And it's certainly something that I've seen in my practice in Australia. I'm an occupational therapist and I've seen a number of people with FND have um, sensory processing difficulties. Um, so Jessica, over to you. To... Great, thanks, Kate. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm happy to share some of what um, we've been doing to try to help people with FND who report some difficulties with sensory processing. Um, and so, you know, how I'm going to do that today is share a little bit about occupational therapy's role in assessing sensory processing diffi difficulties um, and share a little bit of some of what we're seeing in our research around that and then really hone in on, you know, what do the interventions look like um, for helping people with functional neurological disorders who have sensory processing difficulties. And we'll mostly do that through um, a case example so you can see really how um, that translates into real life. Um, but just a quick plug for, you know, what is occupational therapy? And um, occupational therapy is defined as the therapeutic use of everyday life activities for the purpose of enhancing or enabling participation in life roles, habits, and routines. And really the goal of OT is to facilitate achieving health and well-being and participation in life um, through the use of everyday activities and um, helping persons with FND engage in meaningful occupation-based activities is really what makes occupational therapists uniquely positioned to help um, these patients in their recovery. And just to kind of highlight, um, as occupational therapists, our roots are actually in mental health. And that's, that's where a lot of the framework for how we look at things has come fr comes from. And we take a holistic approach to understanding and assessing a person by looking at the physical, the cognitive, social, and emotional aspects of their lives and, and how things are, are um, are working and interacting. And so what's interesting is our framework really blends nicely with um, the biopsychosocial approach that's endorsed for assessment and treatment of people with FND. And again, that's why um, OT is really such a significant contributor to the successful treatment of, of people with FND. And just um, a quick plug here, the Gold standard for care of patients with FND is really this multidisciplinary team approach. And while occupational therapy has been recognized as part of um, the multidisciplinary intervention, until recently, there really hasn't been a lot of evidence to guide therapists in how best to help these patients. And so this is a consensus recommendation article that came out this past year to help guide clinicians um, to be on the same page about you know, what, what works, what helps um, get these people better. Um, but my colleague, Julie McLean and I, um, who work together at um, Massachusetts General Hospital, we've really been advocating for a closer examination of this idea of sensory processing and um, some of the complaints and, and difficulties that people are sharing with us. And we'll really spend the majority of the time talking today to kind of answer this question, like why sensory processing? And we know from the literature 
um, that people with FND endure sensory motor and cognitive difficulties, and that many report that their sensory experiences can trigger or amplify some of their neurological symptoms. And in our clinic, we found that many people with FND endorse sensory processing difficulties, such as a hypersensitivity to lights, to sounds, to moving targets or a crowded environment. And that, you know, they were complaining of poor body awareness, kind of clumsiness or bumping into things. And oftentimes some cognitive difficulties like um, challenges with memory and attention. And that there's not a lot of um, self-generated coping strategies that they could share with us about you know, what, what they do when they're having these sensitivities. And what we found is that really these limitations result in decreased participation in ADLs, your self-care tasks. And um, people are avoiding doing things because of their sensory experiences. And um, this made a lot of sense to us because as OTs, we are educated in sensory integration theory and we wanted to explore it that further. So um, just to kind of clue you in, sensory integration uh, theory outlines the relationship between the nervous system and sensory processing abilities. And it's highly researched in the field of OT within pediatrics and then more recently in the adult mental health population. And it states that a person's ability to process sensory information from their own bodies and the outside world allows you to adapt and interact effectively with your envi environment. And I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, we all learn about the five senses, you know, growing up, but um, that as OTs, we also look at the vestibular system so those little receptors in your ears that tell you where your body is um, moving to and um, proprioception, which are those deep receptors in our, in our joints that you know, tell us where our body is in space. And you know, that's what, um, when we're feeling deep pressure, that's, that's the system that's being impacted. And that those two, um, systems, the vestibular system and the proprioception system really are the powerhouses to regulation and, and being able to kind of get yourself into um, a good state. And, you know, this is kind of a, a big crowded picture, but um, the goal of this is to really highlight how our ability to process sensory information is so intertwined with our nervous system. And so those, those pink boxes, they're talking about all that sensory information that we take in, like lights and you know the train and the background, whatever sounds and um, you know things that are going on in our environment. And then we process that information and it goes through a part of our brain that is responsible for emotion. And so as we process this information and it's organized, it gets interpreted and a physical and emotional response is generated. And so when there's dysfunction in how we take in sensory information and it's organized, it, we can have that fight or flight response, um, that maladaptive response to um, sensory input. and you know, one way to think about it is, you know, if you think about certain smells or sounds, you know, can trigger a memory for any of us, right? And that there's usually some sort of emotional attachment to that, whether it's good or bad. And when it's bad, that can get our um, fight or flight system going. And then that heightens, you know, how we're taking in that information. Um, and a component to processing sensory information is this idea of sensory modulation. And this is really what we focus a lot of our time with our patients discussing. Um, and it's defined as that neurological process of regulating our own behavioral responses to sensory input. Um, and fundamental to understanding sensory modulation is this idea that we all have our own unique preferences and tendencies around sensory input. 
You know, I am someone who's very um, sensitive to auditory information. So sounds really kind of great on my nerves really quickly. Um, and, that, and that doesn't bode well for me living in a house with a husband who's constantly playing music and, and craves that kind of information, right? And so, um, you know, it's important to recognize that how we process information as an individual is really, it's different to anyone. And, um, you know, it's really important to understand how you process information because that's going to allow you to be aware and make changes um, in order to regulate and engage more in meaningful activities. And so we talk a little bit with people around this idea of self-regulation and sensory modulation. And self-regulation is the ability to attain and maintain your arousal to um, appropriately for the task at hand. And it requires all those neurological connections that I alluded to on the slides previously. And so arousal is a, part, is a state of the nervous system that describes how alert one feels. And so we all wanna live in that just right balance of being alert and awake and energized. And you know, what do we do during our day to get us there? You know, If you're feeling um, kind of on the low end and in that low arousal state, you know, what kinds of things do we do naturally to just help us wake up a little bit more? Or you know, if you start to feel yourself kind of in this heightened state getting a little anxious, maybe, you know, the, the train is uncoming and you're late for work and, you know, you start to feel yourself getting out of that just right balance, you know, what kinds of things can you do to try to help yourself, bring yourself back into um, that middle ground there? And we really need um, a variety of inputs to, um, sensory input to get us into that self-regulated place. And we do that, um, fl we fluctuate along that continuum of arousal all day. And we make choices consciously and sometimes subconsciously to influence our arousal state. And so if you take a moment to really think about, um, you know, what, what do you do if you're in a boring lecture or meeting to try to help keep yourself engaged and focused? Hopefully this is not one of those times. And um, you know, what about if you're in a noisy environment or a crowded place? You know, how, do, how does that make you feel and how do you kind of keep yourself in a good headspace? Um, you know, if you're touching um, mushy food or wet substances that bother you, you know, what's that reaction that you have to that? Um, and you know, one of the common ones that people talk about is you know, that, that clothing tag that's constantly itching at you in the, in the back of, of your neck. You know, some people totally tune that out and other people rip all the tags out of their clothes. And, and so that really is another example of kind of how we all have our own um, unique systems. Um, and so when there's a dysfunction in our ability to modulate, kind of um, take in and process sensory information and then have an adaptive response to that. Um, sensory modulation dysfunction occurs when our behavioral responses don't match the demands of the situation um, or you have difficulty adapting. So thinking about, um, you know, if somebody's reporting hypersensitivity to light or to crowds or lots of visual stimulation, they may avoid going to the grocery store because that's really overwhelming for them. Um, so OT, OTs can assist with helping people make decisions about active participation. Can they go um, when the stores are not as busy? Can they choose a smaller store? Um, can you use colored glasses or sunglasses or a hat or a visor to help minimize some of that visual stimulation? Um, because we find that when you can't regulate, it can impact your cognitive processing such, and things such as attention and memory, or it may affect your body awareness. Um, and so we really feel strongly that we can provide sensory-based interventions to help people better 
regulate their emotional responses to sensory input in their environment. And that in turn, this will help you be more um, capable of engaging in everyday activities without um, it being so stressful. And when people have difficulty modulating um, sensory input, it results in either an over-responsive or an under-responsive um, sensitivity here. So um, somebody who's over-responsive or sensory sensitive, kind of like I described earlier with, um, you know, really having a hard time being able to tune out you know, sounds in the background, I get really easily distracted by that. And, um, you know, somebody else may um, be under responsive. And so it takes a lot of auditory information to kind of get somebody's attention. You know, it's that, um, I always bring up that idea of like the bull in a china shop. They're kind of totally banging into things and loud and stomping their feet. And because they need a lot of input, um, and there may be sensory seeking because it takes a lot of um, sensory information for them to really register that, that input. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, so when you're in sensory overload, either hypersensitivity or um, undersensitive to um, information, it can result in um, any of these, whoops any of these things listed here. And um, essentially maladaptive responses occur and that really can impact your ability to participate in daily life activities. And um, so I mentioned earlier that there's been some, um, really a growing body of evidence and research around sensory processing difficulties. And, and who are the people that are having these difficulties? Um, and um, focus really on mental, mental illness and mental health and sensory processing. And it's been found that a lot of people with um, sensory processing difficulties often have post-traumatic stress disorder or an anxiety disorder or a major affective disorder such as depression or bipolar disorder that it's seen in people with dissociative disorders, kind of that out-of-body feeling, um, OCD, and that it's also um, found in people who have um, a history of childhood abuse, um, who have poor stress coping or a lot of psychological distress, who have interpersonal difficulties, difficulties with relationships. And these, these types of things have been identified in the literature as predisposing vulnerabilities for people with um, who wind up developing FND. So it's not surprising to, you know, you start to see that that link um, forming and, and why it, it makes sense and, and people are having the sensory experiences um, that they're having. And um, I won't go into um, the details here, but um, this is a, a bunch of different articles that really highlight some of those things that I just talked about as far as how difficulties with sensory processing um, is correlated with different things like post-traumatic stress and relationship difficulties and, um, you know, ability to gauge in, in work activities. Um, and so what I, what I would like to share a little bit about is um, some of the research that my colleague Julie McLean and I and a few others um, have, have put together on what we've been seeing in our patients with functional neurological disorders and, um, and some of the sensory processing that they're um, experiencing. And so we had a collection of about 44 of our patients. And, Get that. Could you try again? Oops, sorry, Siri. Um, 34 were females and, and 10 were males. And um, we had, um, a variety of 
um, different histories here as far as anxiety and history of childhood physical abuse and pain. Um, and what we did was, as part of our clinical practice as occupational therapists, we give all of our patients the adolescent and adult sensory profile. And this is currently the most widely used measure um, for an individual's unique sensory processing and the behavioral responses that they have. And, you know, we gather all this information and it kind of puts it all together into these, these four areas. And so um, it looks at you have a neurological continuum. So people who um, maybe are, are um, it takes a lot of sensory input for them to really register information. And then others that are on the other end of the spectrum and it, it takes just a little bit, their, their, their reaction to sensory information is, is heightened. Um, and, and so the behaviors that, that we see related to that. And so each person, as they complete their, um, their sensory profile, will be identified as either, um, as far as see their seeking of information, like in their environment. Um, you might be somebody who um, really likes to go running to clear your head or, um, these are the people that really, they get pleasure from a rich sensory environment. You know, they're cranking the music, they're having a dance party. Um, and then, um, and then there are the, there's how much do you avoid sensory input? And so sensory avoiders tend to limit their exposure to sensory information. And so that may result in some social withdrawal. Um, and then there's kind of how that idea of that registration, either low registration takes a lot or is sensitive and um, you're reacting really quickly. And so what we found was that um, most of our patients are experiencing um, a lot of sensory sensitivity when compared to um, the norm, right? So this information was, they, they looked at 350 something people's sensory profiles and said, on average, most people tend to respond this way. And so that's, um, that's that green bar, similar to most people. So if I, my sensitivity to information coming in is similar to most people or it's more than most people. And what we're seeing is with our patients with functional neurological disorders, they're much more or more sensitive to sensory information than the average person. And they also are much more or more sensory avoiding. So they're, they're avoiding situations where they're gonna have a lot of um, sensory experiences. Um, and Interestingly, though, they're also low registration. So they're people who require a lot more sensory input to really get organized and focused. And so this really doesn't um, make sense um, if you were to look at it logically. But I think that's the point, right, is that the sensory processing um, part of your system is, is out of whack. And so it takes a lot of information, but you're avoiding that information because you're feeling sensitive to it. Um, and so then people disengage and then they're not getting what they need. And, and so we're seeing some of those cognitive difficulties, right? Cause you're not getting the input that you need to really get into that good um, space where you can take in information. And this is also very similar. Um, to the patterns that we've seen in studies with people with post-traumatic stress, with anxiety, with affective disorders, all those things that we talked about earlier. Um, and I'm not gonna go through some of this. This is some of the nitty gritty details. Um, but so now, that, now we know this, right? That we see people are experiencing sensory difficulties and, and now the profile kind of helps us understand how they're processing information and then what behaviors they're engaged in, how, what are they doing? 
And so now we can really look at helping people figure out well, what do I do about it? How can I um, get better? And so the rest of this time I'll spend sharing um, some of what we do as occupational therapists um, to treat people for this sensory processing difficulty um, with specifically um, patients with FND. And I'll, and I'll use a case example so that um, it really illustrates how that looks in everyday life. Um, but just kind of an overview in our OT assessment, we focus on, um, one aspect we focus on is sensory modulation and you know, we'll look to gain an understanding of what are people's sensory symptoms? You know, are they having hypersensitivities to lights or sounds? Are there specific triggers that bring on their, their symptoms? Are there any strategies or activities that make their symptoms better? What kinds of coping strategies do they use to help manage their symptoms? And then we look to try to understand better um, the impact of these symptoms on participation. Are they having difficulty managing work or school related activities? Are you avoiding leisure activities or social situations? Are you avoiding certain environments? You know, sometimes people are, um, you know, avoiding the grocery store, like I mentioned earlier, or, they, or they're having trouble even going to work because of, of those experiences. And then, um, we do that more, get more explicit information with that profile I, I told you about. And so the case we're gonna talk about is um, a 54 year old woman with a 10 year history of um, sensitivity to LED lights. And um, this was followed by at times a, a constellation of motor and cognitive symptoms, such as an inability to speak, some leg weakness and clouded thinking. And so her diagnosis was FND with mixed symptoms. Um, and she lives alone. She was independent with all of her self-care and, um, and home making activities. And um, she was out of work. She, worked, she was a teacher and she'd been out of work for about a year. And she was noticing um, she had reduced participation in social outings. And so some of the triggers that we identified were the LED lights, um, the fire, alar fire alarms, that, that halogen burst, you know, that kind of flashing light, um, sunlight on chrome surfaces, like if you're in the car and that, that bright light that kind of, um, you know, can blind you for a second there. Um, and also, um, she was over overstimulated easily by, sounds and kind of high intense conversations. And so in, in talking with her um, a little bit more, she was able to identify that her symptom management strategy was drinking wine. So that's one thing, maybe not the healthiest. And um, if, you know, um, and that was really it. She didn't have any other strategies. Um, but her, the impact that it had on her is her, um, it affected her cognition and she had reduced processing and, and difficulty focusing her attention, which led to her being unable to work as a teacher and she was only doing her shopping online. So she was really not leaving the house very often and she really didn't have a daily schedule. And um, she had been really active in um, a hiking group and she was no longer able to lead the nighttime hikes. So those, those lights that you would wear um, to light up the, the hiking trails and that she wasn't driving um, much, especially at night and really just kind of locally during the day. And as we dug a little bit, we found some of those predisposing and precipitating and perpetuating factors that led to her FND. And um, so one of those predisposing factors was her husband and youngest son had died in a plane crash 22 years ago. And in around 2010, this light sensitivity around Christmas lights started and she'd have experiences with nausea and a sense, general sense of um, not being well. And um, that was around the time where she found out she'd been in a long-term relationship and found out that um, 
her significant other was actually married for most of their relationship. And so there was some, some kind of correlation with the time of year and, and the lights and, and this happening. Um, and that um, the fire alarms at work would go off and it would send her into a, a panic attack. And so that was really one of the precipitating factors to her not, um, not being able to be at work. And so we looked more closely at, um, at her sensory processing and coping skills. And um, we started this with the interview. So some of those questions that I highlighted um, just a few moments ago around sensitivities, avoiding behaviors. And, and this is what we found, um, you know, those sensitivities, like we talked about how she was avoiding different things. She was able to identify the fact that the holidays were just around the corner as a current stressor that she was having and that she was exploring the idea of going back to work as a teacher. And that was something she was excited about, but it was also a stressor for her too, because she was really worried about, you know, being successful at that. And she actually did have some good coping strategies outside of her four ounces of wine. She um, engaged in meditation and some moving and stretching. She um, was journaling. She had a psychologist that she was seeing um, one time a week. And those are all things that she identified as, um, as effective um, and helpful. Um, but she was also um, drawing the shades starting at... Um, at dusk because of, of the lights from outside and cars going by. And um, she was really concerned about um, the change in season and it being dark out earlier and, and the holiday lights. And so we, our treatment consists of all of these different things. We do a lot of education with people around their um, sensory profiles, what, what we found, um, you know, what, what we're seeing and, and, and how just all that stuff we talked about, how the sensory system and the nervous system um, are kind of entwined and work together. And we implement the sensory modulation, what we call the sensory modulation program. And then we do some other stress management, try to help people develop a routine, promote normal movement, do some compensatory strategies. But really the next little bit of time, I'm going to focus on this idea of, of us creating a sensory modulation treatment program for people. And so the sensory modulation program is actually um, based on the program developed by Tina Champagne, who is an OT who's done a lot of work with sensory modulation and, and mental health. And there's really four goals of this program. And the first is to increase self-awareness. So if we don't know how our bodies work and how we process information, we can't really do anything different about it, right? So a lot of time educating on, um, on the sensory profile and, and what we found and using that self-regulation scale of, of that just right arousal state. Um, we'll also um, explore self-regulation strategies. What are some different sensory tools that might be helpful that you've never tried before? And so we'll get in the clinic, we'll do some exploring of some different types of um, sensory experiences like beanbag tapping where we take a, a big kind of heavy beanbag and have somebody kind of give that deep pressure tapping up their arms and legs and that can really help um, with focus and helping somebody feel grounded. Um, maybe it's a bucket of ice water or those, um, those little atomic hot ball candies. You really can't think of anything else when you have one of those in your mouth, right? Um, weighted blankets, colored glasses, different, just different things that, um, you know, we, we let them explore and say, you know, how does this make you feel? What, you know, do you like this or you don't like this? And then we um, encourage people to go home and, and try those tools, you know, at home or in the community or, you know, spend some time thinking about what other types of sensory experiences might be helpful for them. And then we develop a sensory diet. So these are activities that you use throughout the day to try to improve sensory-based activities that um, 
try to improve your overall self-regulation. Um, and then from there, as people have those opportunities to try different sensory tools and see what works and what doesn't work, you start to kind of develop more understanding of yourself. And so we really then look to expand that to, you know, try, try something new on your own and really encourage independence with, you know, figuring out what works. And then how do you, bring that to a wide variety of situations and really get people back um, out there. And so this is an example of the sensory profile and, um, and the types of questions that it asks and what her responses were. So thinking about that auditory processing, some examples of questions are, I hum, whistle, sing, or make other noises. And is that something I almost never do, seldom do, occasionally do, frequently do, or almost always do? Um, I startle easily at an unexpected or loud noise. I have trouble following what people are saying when they talk fast. Uh, I leave the room when other people are watching TV or, and I, or I ask them to turn it down. I'm distracted if there's a lot of noise around. I don't notice if my name is called. And so, you know, as, as you can see, there's a lot of almost always and almost never. And we see that a lot with people where, you know, yes, I do that all the time or, oh God, no, I don't do that. That's, that sounds horrible to me. And there's really very few um, that are kind of in that occasionally. And, and I think that's why we see people wind up in those outskirts of more than most people, because it's really, it's, a, it's an, it, an intense response, like, no, I never whistle or hum or make other noises, or I almost always startle at noises. Whereas most of us, you know, might be in that occasional, yeah, if I'm overtired or, you know, I, I'm stressed out or I'm having a bad day. Um, and so when we looked at her information, um, her pattern of sensory processing followed the, that that most of our patients with FND do, and that she's sensitive to sensory input much more or more than most people, has very negative reactions to sensory stimuli, finds them overwhelming and invasive, um, and she has a low threshold. It doesn't take much to be triggered. Um, and so she's also very sensory avoiding, and she's not going to stores, and she's not driving, she's not going on her hikes at night. Um, but the, also this idea of low registration, it takes longer for her to respond to stimuli that others notice right away. And um, her current environment, based on this information, really doesn't provide the necessary intensity or variability in sensory information to sustain her attention to be able to perform daily tasks, um, which creates cognitive interference with performing um, daily activities. And we see this often. Um, and so this goes back to um, earlier, um, that idea of, of increasing somebody's self-awareness and education on self-regulation. So we'll spend some time talking about you know, what does the just right balance really look like and how do we recognize that in ourselves and how do we recognize when we're kind of getting into that high arousal or shut down mode where everything just shuts down, you're not taking in anything anymore. And, you know, when, how do we recognize we're, when we're kind of in that lower arousal state and, and need to do something to try to, um, you know, perk ourselves up a little bit. Um, and then one of the other things that we'll do with people is um, do the sensory preference checklist. And this divides up a bunch of different activities amongst the five um, senses and includes actually movement. And we'll have people go through and say, you know, rate these things on how they make you feel um, as far as are they calming, are they alerting, or are they irritating? And so our patient went through starting with riding a bicycle and each bullet point and either put a C for calming, an A for alerting, or an I for irritating. 
And that helps us start to think about, um, it gives you a lot of different um, sensory based activities and it helps us start to develop a plan for here are some things that are gonna help, help you get more calm and here are some things that you can do to help um, get yourself more alert. And um, here's just another example of touch and temperature. So thinking about soaking in a hot bath and what does that do for you? Or, you know, some people getting, getting a pedicure and getting that those feet scrubbed is a horrible experience and other people love it, you know? So really kind of getting a sense for, you know, getting people being um, self-reflective and, and increasing their self-awareness to like, what, what do I like and not like? And so based on that, this is what we found um, for, for this patient is that some calming things for her was sucking on a mint or hard candy, that she enjoyed doing deep breathing exercises, watching the sunset or the sunrise, and that you know she, she liked movement. And so running, walking, biking, um, and that was also identified as some things that were alerting for her, right? And if you think about um, what we talked about earlier with that movement um, and proprioception, that's, it does kind of both things at once. Um, you know, after a good workout, you can feel really energized, but also really kind of calm and clear and focused. And, and that's the sweet spot. That's where we all kind of want to be all the time if we, if we can. And so different alerting sensations, she found good food, um, also fluorescent lighting and, and feisty conversations with her friends. And things that were really irritating was the sunlight coming through the window, cluttered desk, the fire siren and intimate touch. And so based on her responses to the checklist and her sensory profile, we gave her um, an individual, individualized um, sensory um, experience to trial. And so um, we asked her to try these things and reflect on how um, it may have impacted her behaviors or symptoms so that we could then say, okay, this is what your sensory diet is gonna look like because you found that these three things really worked but maybe music and yoga didn't work so much. So we're not gonna use those. Um, and so some examples of how this worked for our patient is she found that eating a strong mint and listening to loud fun music on her walks reduced the duration and intensity of her symptoms once they were triggered by the LED lights. And when she was triggered, she found that snapping her fingers or clapping her hands distracted her and reduced the duration and the intensity of the symptoms that she was feeling. She also found that holding um, a frozen water bottle on long car rides was really grounding for her and would reduce the onset of symptoms. So that's really big, right? This is somebody who wasn't really going anywhere and she really wanted to go on this trip with her girlfriends and it was gonna be a long drive and it was gonna include nighttime driving. And so um, we worked on this plan where she could um, implement a sensory tool like the frozen water bottle and, um, and it kept those symptoms, her, you know, she would get headaches and confused and cloudy. And, and it kept those from starting so early in her trip. And, um, and she found some different ways to use some mindfulness activities um, to help minimize those symptoms once they did start and kind of bring those back down. And so this helped us then develop her um, sensory diet. And, um, you know, this shares a little bit more about what a sensory diet would look like. And so what we do is help people identify sensory meals. So, you know, you're getting the theme here, right? So these meals are part of your everyday routine. You complete two or three of these activities a day as part of your daily routine. So she identified going on a walk with her dog um, and doing a workout in the mornings. 
that in the evenings she wouldn't be on the cell phone, have that bright light um, from there. And um, in the afternoon, she would maybe garden or take a nap or meditate. And then we identified what are some sensory snacks? What are some things that you should use to keep your body focused and comfortable throughout the day? So that process of how am I feeling right now? That arousal state, you know, where am I at? What can I do to kind of stay in this kind of dip versus the peaks and valleys of being really overstimulated, over aroused or under aroused? And so she found cold water on her hands or using a cold washcloth, um, having her pillow close were all things that she could use kind of in the moment when she felt like she needed it to keep herself in a better regulated state, which is different from the meals where you're, that's kind of part of your self-care routine. You're doing that all the time to try to help maintain. Um, and then what are some environmental things that you can do and adaptions that you can make? So, um, you know, she identified having the shades in the winter. And then um, the other piece we look at is um, hideout spaces. So where where's a space, a safe space that you can go um, and access during the day when you need some alone time or quiet time? And then what are some different leisure activities um, that you can engage in for fun and enjoyment? And, um, you know, this environmental supports and the hideout spaces were, were also really important for this patient as she started to go back to work because she was able to advocate for what she needed as far as like, you know, a space where she could go for 10 minutes on a break to kind of get some quiet time or ways to modify her environment so she wouldn't get so overstimulated by clutter and that sort of thing. And really this sensory diet, it continues to evolve over our sessions together, but then um, also over time as, as people start to feel better and engage in more activities. Um, and so, um, you know, this patient began to feel better. Her symptoms were not as intense. The duration was not as long. It went from weeks and days to minutes and hours. Um, you know, th this process really helped her understand how she can take control of the ability to self-regulate so she could access her local community. Um, and she recognized that she really needed to include cardiovascular exercise into her meals as it helped her with her cognition and her focus. Um, the other things, let me see what else do I have here. Um, she found and identified some different um, snacks on her own. So various textured balls or those little rollers with knobs. Um, were things that she identified and kind of tried on her own and, and would use in a moment when she felt like she needed it, um, using a squeeze ball on pressure points. Um, she actually made her own bean bag so she could engage in that. And so she became more independent in the use of the, her sensory diet meals and snacks and, and modifying them on her own, you know, and, and really got um, to the point where she felt empowered to make independent choices, which is really ultimately where we want people to get to. Um, so um, she began working full time and she took that trip away with her friends um, she started a new relationship. She started working um, on some CBT with her therapist around reframing her thoughts with the LED lights. And, um, you know, she really um, embraced these strategies and, and um, you know, acknowledged what worked and didn't work for her and, and made goals for what she wanted to be able to do and what she wanted her life to look like and then problem solve together with, well, how do we get there? Um, and that's really um, important is you need to be engaged in having that back and forth problem solving and dialogue and being willing to 
you know, try something and see that maybe that didn't work and, and not get disheartened and try something else, but that really did work um, for you. And so, you know, this is just a broad how it, it, you know, was applied to her everyday life. So she had her sensory meals that we talked about and her different sensory snacks. And you can see how that translated into increased focus and alertness. Um, being able to focus on um, her lesson plans for teaching and developing those, planning and participating in weekend trips with her friends, the decrease in the symptom, her FND symptoms going from days to minutes. And those were all really powerful, positive things that were a direct result of, of her kind of understanding her sensory system and how it worked and, um, and doing some things to make her responses to those different. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we do, you know, we always look at outcomes as an OT, what are, what, um, what's better, you know, since you started working with us and, you know, those are some really concrete things, but you, the person has to really feel it that they've made improvement too. And so we used, um, you know, this basic question compared to when you first started um, occupational therapy to now rate your general overall overall health. And she reported she felt much improved um, over that period of time. Um, and then here's just a list of different resources. There's FND education specific. Um, there's a couple of um, websites on sensory modulation, um, also some different weighted blankets and, and different types of deep pressure um, things that are available. And then some books that um, are really helpful for people to start looking at, um, you know, their own sensory preferences and tendencies and understanding that. So um, living sensationally how does your engine run and the sensory connection program. Um, and then just a couple of smartphone apps that we tend to use um, are listed there too. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, and any questions that you guys have? Yeah, thanks so much, Jessica. <laughs> Um, as I was mentioning, that's very much what we're seeing in um, our clients with FND. So I've done a number of sensory profiles as well, and I found that people are um, coming up as much more than most people for sensory sensitivity, sensory avoiding, um, and low registration. And I've found that sensory sensation is either much less than most people or similar to most people. Um, and I see a number of our members having those yeah. similar difficulties, um, especially in, you mentioned shopping centres, that's often a big one. The halogen lights are often problematic for people, the shiny floor, the lots of noise, the lots of movement. Um, and we see many people sort of avoiding, so not going to the shops, as you mentioned, and also using compensatory strategies such as um, noise reduction headphones, um, dark sunglasses as well. So with the um, sensory um, diet, do you see improvements? Have you ever done like a before and after on the sensory profile? So this is what the sensory profile was originally and then after a sensory intervention, if you redo the sensory profile, do you get any changes or you haven't done that yet? We haven't done it yet. And, and I've been torn because there's really some conflicting evidence in the literature like, mm. um, you know, Winnie Dunn would say the sensory system that you're born with is the sensory system that that you have and that it, you don't really change it. But then there is other research that shows that, you know, maybe people become dysregulated because of, um, you know, a, a traumatic experience like, you know, people with post-traumatic stress, you know, that that strong correlation between certain sensory experiences and you know, a really bad trauma. And so can, can these, is it, is it that we're impacting that actual neurological process of processing sensory information and that kind of emotional response and behavioral response that we have, um, or 
so that their profile might look different, right? Or, or is it that we're just helping people adapt and make different different choices? And, I, and I'm not sure what the answer is, and it's probably a little bit of both, to be yeah, honest, yeah, but yeah. Um, we haven't done that yet. Mm. Um, but I, I would be curious to see yeah. um, what it showed. Have you done it at all? Please? I haven't done it before and after, no. No, but I'd be interested in that. And also I'd be interested to know, you know, did people's sensory profile get worse after FND? Like, are there some things that might make it worse compared to what it right. was before FND? Um, and I was thinking about, you know, you're talking about the movement activities as part of a sensory diet. And, you know, there's a number of people with FND who might be wheelchair bound or bed bound. So they can't, you know, run and jump and ride a bike and that sort of stuff. So is that sort of, you know, impacting their sensory profile as well when they've got those problems yeah interesting yeah yeah um, yeah it's interesting what came first yeah right? exactly and likewise you know, you're mentioning with the mental illness you know we see a lot of these sensory processing problems in people with mental illness so is a mental illness a result because they're struggling with sensory input or did the sensory profile happen after so it's you know, it's interesting, like, what, what did come first, you know, and we know like, yeah. in childhood trauma, people with childhood trauma have, you know, right. processing difficulties, and we know with childhood trauma, it does impact the developing brain as well. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it would be interesting to, you know, have data that went across a person's lifespan sort of thing to go, you know, and then follow their condition based on their sensory profile, but we don't have that information. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting because yeah. there have been a couple of times where I've had um, patients who um, are adolescents, mm -hmm. you know, and I've done this with them and their their parent is in the room and it's like, well, before F&D, it would have been like this, but now mm -hmm. it's really like this. And mm -hmm. they find it sometimes challenging to answer some of the questions because there's maybe before life with FND and, and after. And, and it does yeah. beg the question of how just the diagnosis of FND and those symptoms are, are actually having an impact on the sensory system and the ability to process yeah. um, as and, well. Yeah, and the other one is when people lose their vision. So people who have the sort of sensory symptoms as in loss of vision, loss of hearing you know, how does that impact and can sensory approaches potentially be used to assist in modulating that as well? So it's an area I think that deserves a lot more research, um, but certainly an area that I'm seeing is a major problem in FND and something that requires a lot more intervention. Yeah. Um, people on the group, um, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask, Adette? Yeah, so actually I've just got one. Yep. By the way, amazing. I'm just oh, I've learned so much. I, I I actually wish that this was live streamed um all over the world because they have to hear what you, you just said. The sensory modulation program treatment, is that just for this is this just for this study or is that was that just for this study or is that treated statewide um, in the US or is that just for the clinical trial? Yeah, so note that actually um, was developed by, um, by an OT named Tina Champagne and it actually started with um, restraint reduction in mm -hmm. acute psychiatric settings and they were finding that, you know, providing some of that sensory um, input was helping avoid restraints. And so the Department of Mental Health said, you know, all um, psychiatric hospitals should incorporate some, some sensory processing um, component to help reduce um, restraint use. And um, so she developed um, through her work, she that program. And one of the um, the websites that I listed, I think it's um, OT Innovations. Yeah. Um, you can you can find her book there and a lot of resources around the sensory modulation program. Yeah. So in regards to using it for FND with this study, um, the percentage of success rates, like with this case, was that particularly high? 
with the that was a pretty um it, it's a pretty sweet case right like it, yeah. it's kind of textbook you want them all to go that way exactly um, it was, it's so good I'm just going oh my goodness if that was the case then wow it's amazing right. Right. I mean, getting back to work and going on trips. I mean, that's really, that's great. I, and I do think um, we see a lot of symptom reduction um, and people getting back to things. Um, but a lot of it is dependent on how um, invested the patient is to, um, you know, sometimes people have a hard time kind of wrapping their head around how something like beanbag tapping is going to help them get back to, you know, their daily activities. Um, so not all are, are so starkly like, wow, that really helped. But, um, but a lot of them do. And, and a lot of times it's subtle um, yes. and it's kind of over time. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, wait a minute. You know, this hasn't happened in three weeks and I didn't even realize it. Yeah. I think that papara reception thing can be really important. Like, you know, we often use like weighted blankets. Um, I know like even with me having like a dog lying on me or that sort of sensory input from the dog can be really helpful. Um, I know when I was walking properly, I had a service dog and that sort of sensory input for the dog next to my leg sort of let me know where my leg was. I used to be able to walk so much better when I'm next to the dog and when I'm not next to the dog and not having that sensory input in sort of letting me know where my body is. Yeah. So I've got a Yeah, and that's why it's here. important to find different mm. um, different things you can use in different situations, yeah. right? Because you can't yeah. always have the dog with you yeah. necessarily. Um, so what other things might mimic that? Yeah, yeah. So did you have a question? Um, yeah, I've got a couple of points. Thank yeah, you, Jessica, for, for your great presentation. One of them that's particularly of interest to me is that you were indicating that with SPD, it possibly is predisposing predispos someone to FND. Um, I, be, I, I guess because that wasn't the situation in my own case, I find it hard to get my, I can understand it and I can see the logic and you've got the statistics but I still can't quite get my head around it or my heart into that aspect because that wasn't the case for me. It wasn't, I had sudden onset FND and it was only once I got it that I then had these sensory issues. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have a sensory profile done and that sensory profile was done six months after I started something very similar to the diet that you discussed. I had I had the diet plan as it were uh, for 12 months now and, or just less than 12 months. And I had it very intense for six weeks where I was doing activities um, on myself independently every half hour. I was doing something, not just wow. twice a day. It was every half hour. It was very intense. You, I was seeing, You were fully engaged. <laughs> fully engaged, fully believed in it. It made my symptoms yep. far worse in the beginning. But in the end, I did get um, relatively better. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've noticed over the period of time since then is that because I haven't been able to see this, I moved. And so I wasn't able to continue to see the um, practitioner twice a week. Um, so I had to just go out on my own and I haven't, you know, I have kids, husband, moving, have a life as it were or not. Um, and so my life is still wrapped around therapy. Like I have therapy three times a week, um, but my symptoms are coming back. So my sensory symptoms are coming back because I don't have the same level of intensity and the, the right person to be for me to be held accountable to. So I'm finding that disappointing because I did go through a noise desensitization program as well. Um, and so that's challenging to sort of um, come back to those symptoms again. It actually really hits you around the head a little bit more sort of second time round. Um, and a lot of what you uh, mentioned as far as the diet, obviously I was doing a few different um, tricks 
had some different hints and tips, um, but very much so that we need, uh, that I needed the person to set me up, to assess me, to get me started, and then to have that really intensive period of retraining my brain. Um, in the graphic you had of the brain, I, that was fabulous because that was a similar graphic that I had been shown myself. So that sort of really makes a lot of sense as to, um, yeah, where, where, how it all sits and how it all functions. Um, and I guess the only other thing, because there's been other research with regards to potential inflammation on the brain and things like that, is that we're still going, we still go down the path of um, psychology versus neurology. And, and, I, and we can't leave it alone, but it's sort of like the, the bugbear of, of every FND patient because some will really resonate. Yes, I had, you know, definitive PTSD. I had definitive trauma. I can see that. Where others are like, I have no idea what you're talking about, doesn't resonate with me. And so we can't then get on board with treatment plans because it just doesn't work. But when you are then explain, oh, there's inflammation in the brain and this is why the emotion receptors are so heightened, then the logical aspect or the science aspect then helps those ones who don't have trauma background. So that's probably my only area where it, it sits a little bit uncomfortably is that and there's plenty of proof I'm not saying that it's incorrect there was just research done in the American um, with the soldiers in the army as to FND and statistics there so there's plenty of proof uh, I'm not saying it's wrong it just because it comes from such people with FND have such different angles or different backgrounds it just doesn't always resonate and until you've got that firmly accepted in your mind, then it's harder to move forward with treatment. So do you mean, just to clarify, um, are you saying um, the idea that it's, it's more psychological versus neurological or that people want to label it one or the other or? Yeah, so if someone's coming that? from, so for me, I, I still feel, and even though I've had some bad things happen in my life, that it's neurological. Um, that's how it, it fits well with me. The science also backs that up and it resonates with me and I can move on with my life. But as in the example that you showed of that lady, um, that she, you know, it talked about that uh, she had loved ones who died 22 years ago. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, that's a really traumatic event. And that's heartbreaking for that poor lady. Um, but other people have had traumatic events in their life too. So why don't why don't they all have FND? We have countries that are going through horrific, you know, horrific situations where all of their family have been, you know, mass murdered, whatever. Um, and and they don't have FND. So it's sort of like, you know, how. So I've been in a situation where they've tried to pinpoint something. Oh, 12 years ago, this happened to you. That's why you've got FND now. And I'm like, okay, I'll accept that because that, you're the specialist and that's what you're telling me. But it just yeah, never... That's, it's still a hard pill to swallow, I think, right? Yeah. 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 And, and I will say one of the things that... Um, I feel like more recently I've, I'm hearing more and more of is that there doesn't have to be some magic traumatic event that happened. Um, and, you know, it's, it's promising to see some of these functional MRI type studies that they're doing. And, and I, and I think, you know, this lives kind of at that, um, that border of neurology and psychology because it could be, or as psychiatry because it could be either or yeah. or a little bit of both and um you know and and so it it look it can look different for different Great person people yeah. and and what resonates right yeah. um I call it I tell people freely it's a spectrum disorder because there's such yeah. a wide range of symptoms you don't have to have all of them and even if you do have them some people have a symptom mildly and can still function where others are so extreme that they're off the chart and they're unable to function right 
Right. Yeah. Um, I'll just give you a couple of really abstract, I hope I'm not hogging up your time, some really odd things that have um, helped me. So before I had my intensive treatment last year, I couldn't walk through doorways. Apparently that's something very similar for people with who suffer from Parkinson's. And so the um, practitioner who I was seeing said, let's try some coloured glasses on you. So he gave me these big cheapy Elton John look like blue glasses, blue glasses. And he sent me down some hallways and it slammed my body up against the hallway and I couldn't get through that narrow opening. So he said, stop, take them off, put on red glasses. So these red daisy glasses, the hippie 50s, 60s looking glasses. And um, with these red tinted glasses on, I could then walk through doorways and hallways for the first time in three years without having my body slammed up against the glass wall. And so he said, right, I, 1,000 repetitions every day. I had to walk through a doorway and up close wow. to the door frame. And so now I can freely walk down uh, hallways and doorways without any issue whatsoever. But that was three months every day of doing that. So that was red tinted glasses. So that's just something a little bit abstract. Um, the other thing that gets my, because I have a neurophysio who comes to me and so she's learning um, along my journey is that when she does a new um, activity with me, my body does not respond very well. I either get tremors, I go into a seizure, just something goes wrong. And so if she tells me the week prior, this is what we're going to do next week, I spend every day, often in bed at night, for about half an hour every day visualising the new activity that she's going to give me. And if I visualise it the week later, I can do it and I don't have any symptoms. So that's been a big win for me. I couldn't do the, the cycle motion in the pool. Um, I nearly had a seizure. And so I said, no. And so I just visualised it for a week. And she said, no, I'm still not game. So I then physically did it in bed, which was quite difficult. And so the second week I got into the pool and I can now do the bicycle motion very freely in water. So visualisation is a really strong sensory tactic that needs to be explored and the one that's just out of the out of the box quite literally and I don't know if you have them in America is crunchy bars do you have crunchy bars in America I'm not sure I don't know what those are so my physio is Canadian actually so I, know, I think she calls it another name it's sort of like honeycomb and it's covered in chocolate oh okay yep yeah. mm -hmm. So when the physio was here and she tried to do something new for me and I got the tremors and the dystonia and them all pinked over and up like this and the tremors started really bad, I said, quick, get one of my crunchy bars and I quickly eat the chocolate off because you can't, you know, dis dismiss chocolate. And um, the sensation of the honeycomb on the front part of my tongue stops tremors. When I went to my Western GP, she said, oh, well, the brain needs glucose, so it would make sense that you need a sugar fix. When I went to my um, practitioner whose passion is neuroscience, he said it was the actual sensation onto the tongue that gave different messages to my brain. And so I sort of tripped my brain and the tremor stopped. So when my physio saw it happening before her eyes within literally 10 seconds, she actually had to sit down. She said, this blows my brain away. I've never seen anything like it. So the importance of sensory input and sensory issues being addressed with, I love your diet, with your meals and snacks, is uh, uh, very much resonates with me. But saying all of that, that all happened for me in um, April, May last year that I did my intensive therapy. I had my sensory processing profile done in the December so approximately six months later and I was still um, as far as the profile was concerned I, I don't know things definitely had improved I didn't have a pre-profile done but I still was as bad as similar to what um, your example was and what your statistics are showing so um, even after that treatment Yes, it definitely improved, but it still was horrendously bad. And I'm, I guess, frustrated in the sense that you don't just have the treatment, oh, I'm better and 
you think you can go away, get on with life. For me, I'm actually learning that I have to have ongoing, it has to be kept up and it has to be ongoing. And that's frustrating because my life, well, it's my goal for 2021 is it's, it's the year of therapy. And so you don't actually have a life. You're just dedicated to having therapy. So, um, yeah, mentally, that's another issue another issue that just has to be addressed. So, but yes, um, as I said in the beginning, my original question was, do people have this before FND? From your research and from your studies, it looks like they did have SPD, but just in my situation, my particular case, it definitely wasn't there beforehand. Um, but then the day that I got FND, I had, everything that could be imagined, <laughs> anything possible on the SPD, I then had. <laughs> and I think that sort of goes to the sort of individual nature of FND. You know, like some people have, you know, everyone comes, everyone develops FND for different reasons. You know, some people might have a trauma background, some people, a virus or something else, an accident, an injury can set it off. Um, so... I think it's just going to individualise treatment because everyone develops FND for different reasons. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for sharing all of your experience. That it's really helpful to hear. Um, you know, as a therapist too, and and I'll, I'll just clarify. You know, those sensory profiles we took. They're they're all after somebody has developed symptoms and FND. So there really is no way to know if we had given this profile to them, you know, six months ago or a year ago, if it would have looked the same as it does, as it does now, because it's only been done once somebody is experiencing symptoms. So it, it, it really is hard to know, um, you know, cause we're not really normally doing a sensory profile in somebody who doesn't have any sensory complaints, <laughs> you know? add something to that yeah so I have found since so I've had FND for just over three years and since having FND where I wouldn't have considered myself anxious prior to um in hindsight which is always wonderful um so at the moment I'm at the point where I can't watch television with the audio going I have to read the subtitles and I rely significantly on lip reading because when people are talking to me, I can't actually process what they're saying very well. Um, but in hindsight, which is fabulous, looking back, I was had high functioning anxiety. So I had lots of strategies in place to prevent me from becoming anxious. So a little bit of OCD tendency. Um, sorry, that's my job. My support workers just arrived. Um, but the other thing is, is I've always had issues when my husband plays loud music. This is pre-FND. When my kids were overly noisy, I've always known that I was a visual kinesthetic learner, not an auditory learner. I've always known that I had, that auditory was not, was my weak point rather than my strong point. I've always had issues with hand-eye coordination and proprioception. Um, but I've noticed since FND that it is significantly worse and to add on to that to date i have not had a sensory processing profile done i've had assessments done for limb weakness um for bladder issues for lots of things but nothing around my cognition or my sensory functioning and i just wonder if that at least doing a sensory review should be a gold standard for treatment of anybody with FND. That's my perspective. Um, yes, I had trauma as my precipitating factor in terms of significant workplace bullying and ghosting. Um, but I don't feel that it's enough of an explanation. And I agree with Sue in that the focus very much on mental health and psychology rather than physiology. And I really feel that to be taken seriously, FND needs more of a focus on the physiological 
the neurological rather than just about it being a mental health issue, which is where it feels that the primary focus is. Now, I've actually relocated from a remote country town to a city to get treatment. And I had my year of therapy last year, um, but my symptoms are getting worse. And there's more of them. Um, and I just feel that this is a big gap, this sensory processing. You know, if, if I've seen people on both sides of the country and this still isn't happening, I think there needs to be more awareness around the sensory profiling. Sorry if I've rambled. No, I think that's a great point because um, the sensory sensory processing and neurological processing are so they're so interconnected. I mean, it's your sensory processing is part of your of of your brain goes through a neurological process to um, you know to um, understand and organize that sensory information and um. And I forget what I was going to say in response um, to that, but I, but I but I think it highlights that there that there's a neurological component to sensory processing, and and when it's out of um, when you're not processing sensory input um, in a in an organized way, it can really get somebody stuck in this fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system kind of process where, where then you really can't, right? You, what you gave is a great example. You might've been a little sensitive to, you know, auditory things before, but now it's like really sensitive, right? And we get stuck in this kind of heightened anxiety um, that, it, that is neurologically based. It's in that sympathetic nervous system kind of being over, um, you know, overstimulated and, and it's hard to, once you're in that, it's hard to get out of it. And you may not even realize you get so used to it and desensitized to it. You may not even realize that your, your brain is kind of in that distress mode. A door slams next door and you jump. Um, adding to Sue's um, crunchy or violet crumble example, um, I find if I'm having a non-epileptic seizure, if I can actually get control of my brain enough, and my, some part of my body enough, if I can start to tap, then that actually shortens the duration of the seizure. But it's, it's managing to get the thoughts going and then managing to get control of a finger to be able to start tapping, that's the tricky bit. I also have a similar thing, Noreen, not so much the tapping, but my husband will either come and do a really firm massage. I can't do it myself. I can physically do it myself but it doesn't trick my brain. The other thing we were taught, and apparently this happens more often in America and it doesn't happen here in Australia, and I'll just try and give you an example, is where you have a, a relatively free limb while you're having the seizure. And if somebody else comes along, again, I've tried it myself and it doesn't trick the brain. Somebody else comes along and does a big massive figure eight and it just goes on and on and on. And look, they may need to do it. The biggest figure eight that is impossible with whatever limb, it can be a leg, it can be an arm, but one of your limbs, and they may need to do it for up to five minutes, which is a very long time for the poor person doing it. Um, and that actually can settle a seizure. It doesn't always, but it can settle a seizure. I can't be touched, but um, if, I'm having an episode of paralysis. If I can move any part of my body and focus on moving that part, then gradually, you know, if I can move my, my big toe on one foot, then I focus on moving the big toe and gradually focus on moving the foot and then gradually focus on moving the leg and, and gradually get the whole of my body responding. Um, so I agree, but in, in terms of the body, touch is just it's out of bounds. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say I'm really sorry, Sue, about your experience. And um, sensory profiling, I have done on my own, like Noreen as well. And unfortunately, I really think it should be done. I agree as part of the treatment and diagnosis here and should be implemented here in Australia. And I, that's, I, I agree with Catherine as well. We're really falling behind. Um, in regards to your study that has been actually published, you said that there was going to be more studies that is needed. Um, how many more studies are there planned in research for 
you know, sensory processing difficulties. Um, is there any plan? Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful. Right now we're waiting on some funding um, to be able to do kind of broader um, broader studies. Right now it's just whoever comes to our, our clinic, you know, where we're keeping the data and we'll keep collecting that. Um, but, you know, I think doing something like, um, you know, patients who just get CBT and then patients who get CBT and, you know, this added sensory, you know, modulation program and, and how does, how does that compare, um, you know, and there, there's a lot that we could do even thinking about, um, you know, those, there's these little, it's almost like a mood ring these little um, stickers that detect changes in your skin temperature, which is related to um, like a stress response. And how does that change at, as you do a sensory strategy, you know, kind of that before and, and after. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity, um, you know, where, purely clinically based. All of my hours are meant to be around clinical practice and doing some of this research has been kind of on the side because it's a passion that I feel like, you know, it needs to get out there. Um, but, you know, now, now we need somebody to pay for it so we can devote our, our time to doing it and, and get more institutions. You know, I think one of the challenges is to your guys's points, not a lot of therapists either A, understand and know how to treat FND and, and B, if they do, aren't always aware of the sensory piece of things. And so um, there's not a lot of people out there doing it, which is why I'm so grateful that Kate reached out and, you know, I want to, I want to find some time, Kate, for us to talk yeah, more to hear great. about, um, yeah. you know, what you guys are doing there too because yeah and I'd looked at getting a student an honor student to get on board and sort of do some of this research because it's been an area that I've been interested in for a number of years so I was really excited when I saw your paper because I'm like that's what I've been seeing and wanting to do so yeah yeah and and I will say at least um you know to your your guys's worries about um you know, people not knowing about the sensory profile and, and having missed an opportunity to get it, we were able to at least get um, get it as a touch point in the consensus recommendations that were published for yeah. OTs. Um, so yeah. it's there and the profile is there. And so hopefully it will start to gain momentum as people yeah. kind of start trying it, incorporating it a little more and really see that that change that can occur for people. So in addition to all of the work that Kate is doing and FND Australia Support Services as a whole is doing, so essentially Kate, um, what can we as non-medical people do to support and facilitate research in this area? Because we're not, we're not um, ac well, most of us are not academics. Most of us are not, you know, from a medical background. Um, but I think as a community, we're all quite passionate about trying to increase knowledge and understanding for our own benefit. So as, as a lay person, what can we actually do to assist? I guess it's like, you know, because we, we're doing like a consumer-led research project with Sydney Uni, and it's getting on board with that aspect. We've trained up some consumers in sort of research techniques but we're all I mean the project's not funded so we're all very under-resourced it's trying to get the funding directed to it so because it's unfunded we're all doing it in our spare time which is you know not much um, yeah it's just trying to get you know promote that sort of co-produced co-designed consumer-led research to get on board and sort of promote this and sort of promote research agendas which you know, it's hard when people feel they don't have a voice. Yeah, and, and I think what we did tonight is a great first step to have, you know, you guys come and share your experiences and, and what's worked and what hasn't worked, I, I think is really important to have those 
yeah. those avenues to to hear from the consumers mm -hmm. right and and those different experiences because they they are going to look vastly different you know across different individuals mm -hmm. and that just is going to help us understand more what works and what doesn't work and why it may work for one person and not another person. And, you know, we get, we get disheartened sometimes too, when we feel like, you know, you're, you're trying this and you're trying that and, and somebody isn't getting better. Um, you know, and not everybody is, is able to commit as much time as you guys have, have talked about doing and really doing that intensive, um, piece and that's you know really important to try to encourage other people to get over that hump you know so you talked about it was so much worse when you first started and then you kind of got over that hump and it got better and sometimes people just need to to hear that that experience and and shared experience to give them hope that you know it's gonna improve for them too yeah i was definitely <laughs> oh sorry Sorry, oh, I was just going to say I was def I was talking to a lady um, in Washington over the weekend about FND, and um, she was saying that universally it was surprising. We were talking about FND in Australia in comparison to FND in America, and it seems like universally we've got the same um, problems in regards to recognition of FND in regards to funding in regards to you know the treatments so what you're saying is you know quite right it confirms it all you know just just putting it out there you know we're all fighting the same fight we're all saying the same thing right here across the world yeah, yeah. all right okay. well, we should leave that there thank you so much for your time jessica that was just fantastic i'm sure that thank you so much for inviting me i'm i i really i'm happy to have been here and, and been able to hear everybody's stories too Great. Thank you for a lovely presentation. Uh, it was thanks it, so much. Really good. Best of luck to everybody. Take sure. care. Right. See, you. Bye -bye. See you later. Bye.